Welcome to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors. Dr. Allen chats with successful investors exploring their journey from setback to triumph. Through this window, we glimpse the truths that inspire our guests to invest abundantly and flourish in all areas of life. And now your host, Dr. Allen. Welcome to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors, where we delve deep into the lives of our successful guests to learn the secrets of thriving to flourish abundantly in all areas of life. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. Today's guest has 11 plus years of experience as a real estate accredited investor with a focus on value add C-class properties. She is the owner and principal of a thousand plus unit apartment buildings via 1031 exchange and syndication. After quitting her day job to invest in real estate full time, she is passionate about teaching others to do the same. She now focuses her time and expertise on helping typical nine to fivers to quit their jobs in 10 years or less. So welcome to our program, Elisa Sang. Hi, Dr. Allen. How are you? Thank I you for very, having me. I'm very, very good. You can just call me Allen. Everybody else does. So uh, thank you, uh, Elisa, for uh, being on the show today. Uh, let's get to know who this mysterious woman is behind uh, the success story here. And a phenomenal success story uh, it is indeed. I'd like to start with your childhood because uh, I think if we understand the child, we can understand uh, the adult and know the adult better. So tell us about a formative experience from your childhood as you look back on it today. You think of it as something that has helped you to be the adult that you are today. Mm -hmm. Well, so I had um, a typical childhood, I would say, uh, you know, uh, I traveled um, between uh, three different countries, lived in three different countries as I grew up uh, mm -hmm. in my childhood. Um, and uh, each time when I have to move in between countries, uh, I have to learn new different languages uh, and then entire new different sets of friends. Uh -huh. um, so as a child, it was kind of miserable when you have to leave all your friends and family behind uh, and uh, join, you know, um, uh, kind of like a find new friends, right? Uh -huh. um, so, you know, my, my, da my dad was um, kind of traveling around, not really traveling around. He had a different post. He was in Germany uh, at one period of time doing his postdoc degree. Then after a while, because that's back then in Germany, like it's impossible to be a professor if you are not a native German. Um, so uh, then he moved to Canada when there is a little bit more open policies um, and, uh, you know, redid his postdoc over there, got PhDs and all that sort of stuff over there uh, and settled. So meanwhile, for a period of time, I was living in China with my aunt because mm -hmm. in the effort of providing a more stable childhood for me, my dad decided to maybe a better idea that I lived at home in China was my aunt. Um, and uh, so I essentially finished uh, most of my high school, uh, you know, junior high, high school, elementary, mostly in China. So mm -hmm. very different policy growing up. Uh, and then I moved to Germany on and off here and there. And finally to Canada uh, is where I immigrated when I was 17. So it actually taught me a lot. Um, I think the adaptive nature that I have and be able to kind of think quickly on the feet. These are like attributes I would say uh, largely contribute to my success. Um, and there's no rules because being influenced by different cultural and be able to learn the language um, within like a three month or less, even when I was 17, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of put yourself out there, be vulnerable and adapt and make new friends. It's, uh, these are like a really good, uh, skill sets. I think looking back at that, that kind of helped uh, me grow into. Um, yeah. And then the other part I would say is, you know, I had traditionally a strong, uh, our family had a traditionally strong woman in our family. Obviously, like a three generations of strong woman. My grandma, one of the person I really look up to, she's one of the first women that went into university back in Shanghai when she was young. And that's after a divorce, which is really w rare back in, back in China in the, you know, wow. uh, yeah, 40 and 50s. 
Um, but she, she did it. Not only she did the, after divorce, she went to the university and she even had pictures of her riding motorcycles around. So, <laughs> so that was a, a very strong influence. And my aunt, who kind of essentially plays a very uh, fundamental rule, uh, role on my upbringing, she's a, a principal of a, a hospital, you know, and she's always like the person who wears the pants, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. in the family. So, so that kind of gives me a lot of inspiration in terms of like, a, you know, whatever the guys can do, like the woman should be able to do too. Um, so I think that has a lot of uh, uh, influence mm-hmm. to me as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard enough for, for um, and, and children in the USA growing up who have had to, to move from one school district to the other, a lot of times they complain about how, how, how difficult that is, leaving their friends and uh, going to a new place. But they never have to learn a new language on top of all that. <laughs> so they have it pretty easy. But there's a lot of complaining about that from, uh, from children who have to go through that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can see how that, uh, that could have a significant uh, bearing upon your life, not only living in different cultures, but also that, that language barrier and uh, having to pick up a language within a period of three months. And while you're doing that, uh, developing uh, friendships, uh, that, uh, that has to be very intimidating, trying to meet new people in a language that you that you're not comfortable with, uh, it's hard enough to meet new people, at least for me as an introvert. But <laughs> yeah. but having that language barrier on top of it, it's just so much more intimidating. Um, yeah. How did you deal with all that? So you know, I think over the time, I think I was lucky that I'm an extrovert. Uh, as you can kind of tell. So just putting myself out there, be vulnerable and have a kind of like grow a thick skin essentially Mm -hmm. was really kind of helpful. And that really translate into later on when I'm doing uh, syndications because you have to put yourself out there um, and then kind of show some of the more personal aspect of yourself, like your personal finance at least, right? Uh, With other people. So it kind of just never a trouble for me. I think that's why I'm kind of thinking back the moving around at the time was kind of miserable. But many nights I was like cried, but you know, it was um, actually also good because you have to be in front of people, introduce yourself, even though you can't even finish half of the sentence in English, um, but able to kind of just be vulnerable and making that kind of friendship and, and take seeing the opportunities where you can kind of take advantages of uh, in terms of like finding new friends and et cetera. Yeah. Well, and I can see, even though it may not have been particularly pleasant at the time, I can see a lot of advantages to it. I mean, you're now you're you're fluent in not just one language, but at least uh, three different languages. Yeah, and and that has to help you in your syndication uh, yeah. business. Not not yet, not yet. Not yet? Uh, I've I've given presentations in Chinese, have but you? there's a lot of a technical jargons that you uh-huh. don't. Um, if you didn't brought up in China, you didn't learn this in Chinese. It's uh-huh. like they're technical words. Maybe you don't quite get to it. But, and, and also actually moving money from China out is very difficult right now. So uh-huh. I haven't really tapped into that potential yet, that uh, full strength. But uh, I, I certainly see that as opportunities in the future as well. Yeah, I expect there will be a lot of opportunities there. Uh, as uh, as uh, China has such a strong economy and, uh, and there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of people in China investing in the U.S., and uh, I expect there will be a lot of other cross-pollination in the future as well, too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I think it'll position you quite well. Yeah. So, yeah. So, as uh, as you transitioned here, you uh, you came to to North America via Canada, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. How, so, how did you transition from Canada to the U.S.? Yeah, I guess that's one more move. So I should really say it's four countries. Mm. Um, so Canada and U.S. is very different in some ways. It's very similar, but it's very different. Yeah. Um, so it's actually pretty uh, non-eventful. I went to University of Waterloo, um, it, which for some of folks who has heard about it, it's a very much a, a computer engineering centric school. 
Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, so I graduate from computer engineer from Waterloo and they have a direct co-op program with Microsoft or mm. some of the big giants like Amazon's and et cetera over here. Uh, and uh, after I graduated, I just got a job uh, with Microsoft uh, and then moved to the Northwest in Seattle. And that's where I stayed ever since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful place to stay. Beautiful part of the country there. Yeah. Well, what have been uh, some of your uh, your biggest challenges as you've gone out into, you started out in the computer world, uh, you've uh, become um, retired from that and are a full-time uh, real estate investor. What were some of the major challenges along the way? Uh, so I think time management always comes up in the top. Um, I have the habits of uh, committing to way too much than I can chew. I still do that nowadays because <laughs> that's kind of how I push myself moving forward. Um, I think it's just one step at a time. Even, even though it looks like you're looking back at 10 years, 13 years since I got a job, but 10 years of investment uh, history, um, you know, I think at the time it's just moving one step at a time to the next bigger thing, mm -hmm. right? So if someone had this presentation, you know, I thought that describes my journey the best. It's like you're growing an inner circle of like your growth is like a kind of like a circle and then you're, you're knowledge and growth and, and then each step away hope you're like amplifying that circle to a slightly larger so mm -hmm. you're learning more build mm -hmm. on upon what you have learned before and then little do you know in 10 years you're like here um i think um tony robbins has said this maybe uh maybe it's tony robbins that he's basically kind of said hey a lot of people are overestimating what they can do within a year and then underestimate what it can do in 10 years. Um, hmm. Because by accumulation, because a lot of us, you know, we're trained in, especially in North America, like doing stuff fast, like get there, you know? Nice. Um, but it's it's kind of like, oh, I got didn't get there and I didn't get my first deal in first year. It's like, hmm. bummer, right? So like, how do I how do I move forward? And then they don't stick to it. They just kind of give up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and little do they know the success may be just right around the corner. So there were period of time i would say the biggest challenge was not being educated um so when we start investing in 2009 i just basically saved up some of my um work whatever um you know i i had some savings mm -hmm. so that's how we get started 2009 is a great market everything was kind of on discount so we know we want to buy something we didn't really know what the end goal was we didn't really know anything it's like oh it's probably good to like just have some assets yeah so so we bought a condo which i would advise people not to do um because <laughs> we have these hefty H hoas that eats into a profit mm -hmm. we put it on a 15-year mortgage which also i would advise people not to do um so we essentially not having a lot of cash flow but we bought in a great location which i also advise people not to do uh, you probably want to go a great lower than the great location because that's where the cash flow is. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know what we're doing. Um, so we bought a couple single family houses because before we got serious in 2015 when my daughter was born and that kind of really become your why. Like before that, it would just be like the typical 20 year, you know, early 30 year old. Um, aside from doing some enjoyment stuff, you have tons of hobbies. There's not really a, I, I don't think I have a, a very clear goal. You know, work mm -hmm. was still enjoyable at the time. Um, and after a couple of years of doing work that I like to do, uh, start things start to kind of get a little boring at work. You know, certain people are built for certain things, certain they, people are built yeah. for corporation. That's, I never was, you know. So for me, it was like kind of boring. The, mm -hmm. the higher up that you go, the more politics that I was involved in was not something that I really enjoyed mm -hmm. doing. Um, so in 2015, when my daughter was born, it's kind of like, you know, really kind of tipped the boat there because I was com spending more time commuting than spending time with her. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say the biggest challenge, sorry, kind of went a little sideways there, um, is not having enough knowledge. Like, mm -hmm. you know, knowing what I know now, probably get into cash flow games a lot sooner 
And then instead of limiting ourselves to like single family, we'll probably get into multifamily right away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that will fast forward the journey. And knowing what I know now, even in 2015, what I know in 2015, I would probably have a clear goal and start having a system and kind of tracking towards that goal. Mm-hmm. Because then, you know, we could have just be done in 2015. You know, there's a lot mm-hmm. more opportunities back then. But instead, you know, I quit my job in 2019. Instead. Still pretty good, but, you know, it'll mm-hmm. be a little faster. Yeah. <laughs> well, interesting trajectory there. Um, and uh, the way you kind of explain it, I mean, I like that that concept of it's it's like a, a circle, and that circle can just uh, continue expand with with knowledge, uh, information, and uh, experience. Uh, and the way you described it, it was kind of like just a real smooth uh, transition. While well, you didn't know exactly what you were doing at first, but it expanded uh, quite nicely. What all successful people have had to deal with uh, disappointments and setbacks in their life if they're actually really successful. So share with us one of the major uh, disappointments and setbacks in your life, and it may be related to business, it may be uh, something uh, personal, but uh, one of the most major things in your life that you've had to deal with and to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's many, actually, I can think of, um, you know, I'd probably start with um, one of the small apartment building that we bought. Um, so we kind of talk about before we were just setting up on equity. That's, you know, before we know any better about cash flow we got into. Mm-hmm. Um, so 2015, we switched our portfolio to cash flow, like um, 1031 into fourplex and et cetera. We did BRRRS, mm-hmm. um, essentially uh, bought, uh, what was it? Buy, uh, renovate, rent, refinance, and then repeat, right? So mm-hmm. did a couple of that. We got all my money out, which is great. So then I was like, okay, think about that. So one circle would not go one circle bigger. So we're going to look for, you know, small apartment building. Something structurally it's pretty similar to fourplex. We got a deal in Tacoma Mall area. If anyone who's local in Tacoma knows Tacoma Mall is like, ugh, like terrible area. Um, but we bought a 12 plex over there. Um, it's all it is, is a set of consecutive parcels of three properties that are four plex. So we know the structure very well. So nothing to learn there. Um, but we went to Tacoma from Seattle to Tacoma. It's an hour and a half with traffic back and forth three hours. So that basically took it. And that was intentional because we wanted to not self-manage property anymore. We want the PMs to be managing it for us. Mm-hmm. And then we manage the PM. So that allows us, it forces us to go to that more model. Uh, and two is I took on a partner. Um, so that was also intentional. I wanted to kind of learn how to manage partner expectations. Um, so that property was the pendulum swing all the other way where we're looking at only cash flow, right? So we're like, oh, great. It's going to be an A cap property. We didn't, we're not that sophisticated back then. You know, the seller can kind of cook their books. And, but anyway, it was 8%. So we're like, great. This is going to be cash flow. What it ended up to be is we actually burned a lot of time on it. There's a lot of headache on it. There's a lot of unit turn. Vacancies, we're dealing with it. We, we got all the projects done. Within two years, we were able to, less than two years, we were able to sell the property and get 100% equity. So you'd be like, oh, that's great success. It's like, no, actually that two years feels like a wasted because if we learned any better, uh, we would have gone out of state further, faster or maybe not having the pendulum swing to the side of the cash flow as much because mm-hmm. it's more riskier, right? Like we didn't know this because we would only look at what metrics like maybe a balance between like a location equity and you know cash flow is a better play so so that's one thing that we learned is a i would say like a kind of a big failure i look at it because we could actually have a lot more opportunities like but we were playing with the market so that was good we still got a profit but it was nothing at all like what we set out to do right so um so that was kind of one thing um, and then another example would be, you know, once we went outside of state, uh, we started doing syndication. Our first syndication deal, we actually were not able to close it. And it, it was not able to close at the uh, 20, 23rd hour or whatever mm-hmm. you say it. 
Um, it's literally, we, we needed one more day of extension mm. on the deal, have the seller sign it for one more day of extension and we close it. And we sourced that deal directly from this owner. This owner is a little crazy. Um, <laughs> and he just decided it's a good time to hike up the price 10%. And we have investors. If it was our money, maybe we can flex it, but uh, I'm not negotiable when it's our investors' money. So uh, we have to say no and then walk away from the deal. Um, and it was a first syndication deal. We weren't part of any education program. Our network is basically coming from people who I worked with, friends and family, all the other mm -hmm. stuff. So it took a long time for us to raise the money. It took a long time for us to find the right person to kind of co-sponsor with us essentially mm -hmm. to get in a recourse loan. That was one goal I set out to do. Um, and finally we're almost there. Like, you know, a lawyer took one day too long and we couldn't close the deal. So that was really hard wrench when that, especially when that's your first deal. Yeah. Um, but looking yeah, back, it's not at only the disappointment, but that, yeah. you know, the reputation you'd been working hard to, uh, to yeah. develop, uh, is suddenly, is suddenly undermined and, um, yeah. Yeah, that had to be a big disappointment. Yeah. So the reputation part, it was actually, didn't really actually hurt us much. Oh, that's good. That's if good. anything, it helped us because we, I lost $30,000 in that deal. Not a huge lot. It was a, just a 50 unit property, right? Um, but our investor didn't lose a dime. And they actually mm -hmm. appreciate the fact that, that we were non-negotiable when it's 10% more. If the number would have worked, we would move forward. But mm -hmm. we didn't feel the number was working. Yeah. Um, so they appreciated the fact that, that we hold our heart line, took the loss ourselves, um, and uh, they got right back in for the next deal that we presented. Oh, right? that's so, great. so that that's was great. actually good, um, but there's a lot of lesson learned from there, which is that's why we work with brokers only now. And there's also reason why, uh, you know, certain states we don't invest it in because certain rules are required for escrow company versus lawyers. Um, so. You know, we learned a lot from that experience. Yeah. 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 Well, those things are never, never pleasant. But, uh, yeah. but uh, you know, as, as we look back on those, we can oftentimes uh, think of them as some of the, the best learning experiences that, uh, that we've had in life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, um, so tell us, what is, uh, what is your purpose? in life where do you find your deepest meaning um i think it's to enable others i think right now at this moment is to enable others uh to do what i did um and and i would just share this with you alan like uh i i have always been the single income earner in our family mm -hmm. uh and i don't i make a good salary but like during the times I was working W2, I was nowhere near, I'm just a regular, um, you know, product manager. Uh, yeah, like I'm maybe a little senior up there, but I'm not like a director or anything. I don't make like a huge check. Um, and by Seattle standard, um, you know, we're comfortable. I, I wouldn't say that we're not, we're in the poverty as or anything. We're comfortable. Um, so, you know, and during the time, this 10 years going to FI, you know, I had two babies. Um, mm. And uh, so I feel like, you know, and also we started with not knowing, like there's basically time wasted for the first five years, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't think they're exactly wasted because they accumulate a good equity, which allows us to do more stuff in the future. Mm. Um, but definitely not efficiently leveraged, right? Um, so I would say like with the right amount of educations and et cetera, um, I feel confident that anyone in my position or make more than me or who doesn't have kids can reach to their financial freedom uh, in 10 years or less. And for some people, double income earners or a single person who doesn't have a lot of expenses, they could easily get there in five years or less. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's something that I want to kind of help other people learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's because I coming from a strong, like a Fam, like family with woman, you know, I, I want to kind of help level the playing field in terms of helping women mm -hmm. investors to kind of further a little bit more with their knowledge, financial education, so to kind of get there mm -hmm. faster. Um, 
so that's that's kind of what I feel very strongly um, passionate about advancing, like my big why at this point. Because once you kind of reach that, if I your goals and stuff kind of has to readjust a little bit, and you're like, I'm here. <laughs> what is the next step, right? Um, so that's another reason why I kind of started an education program with the EZFI University um, is to kind of teach other people to be financially literate. Um, so that they could kind of get there. Uh, and in the future, this, who knows, maybe it will grow into a place where we also helping people to get out of their debt, you know, um, to help people like our tenants um, getting out of debts and et cetera as well. Wow. Yeah. Just some big aspirations there. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see you focusing on, on women. Um, I've, t- I've uh, interviewed a number of very successful women. Women do very well in this industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it to me is in, re- in many respects uh, a perfect industry for uh, women. And yet, of course, the majority of, of operators uh, still tend to be men. But, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot that, uh, I mean, when women are in it, they do very, very well. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad to see you doing that. Uh, that's a, that's a, some wonderful aspirations there. Thank you. And I think in general too is, um, you know, like it's the financial literacy part. It's not just, you know, real estate. Yeah. Um, I went to a Charles Schwab like presentation and one of the stats that they share was really resonating with me about like, you know, majority of the women do not invest. So they're left with, um, you know, when their spouse passed away, mm-hmm. it's actually really bad because a majority of them will switch uh, financial advisors, but not based on education. You mm-hmm. know, of course, it's mm-hmm. just whoever kind of come in and they feel like emotionally connected. They weren't making decisions uh, based on literacy. Um, so they, um, and then uh, it's a very tough time to be when your spouse passed away. Mm-hmm. You're probably old at that point. Uh, and be very vulnerable with all your nest eggs and you don't half of them don't even know where uh, their husband has put their investments at Mm -hmm. right Um, but the stats has also showed that when women invest they're better investor because they're more likely to stick with something uh, and uh, they're very considerate Um, and uh, uh, you know and but when asked how confident are you with your investment and like 80 percent of women will say like not so much not sure right um so it's not the knowledge that they were lacking like when they're doing research and etc it shows like they even with men but the confidence level is a lot less um mm. so i think there's definitely some playing like play fields that can be leveled uh right. you know yeah. 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 yeah yeah for sure yeah well we're coming to uh, the end of our time here uh has really been an enjoyable conversation. Uh, I have one last question that I ask almost all of my uh, guests before I get to that. Uh, share with our viewers and listeners uh, how they can get in touch with you and expand just a little bit more on, uh, on your school. Cool. Awesome. Be happy to. Um, so we uh, have start, just started um, a beta program for our Easy FIU. It stands for Easy FI University. You can find us on www.easyfiuniversity.com. Uh, like I said, it's kind of beta program uh, with a background of product manager. I always like to build MVPs, minimal viable products to start with. Um, and so the program actually has three pillars. Um, it's intent to build a community. So one of them is uh, the, the main course, the 12 modules that we will uh, set out for the users. And then that's accumulated from years of talking with investors. These are 10 topics that comes up all the time. And then two more topics about like, you know, will we realize you know, also control your expenses mm-hmm. or have a plan for your expenses and having a goal and habits to kind of hit it on a day, day in, day out per, uh, basis. Um, So that's the main course in terms of module. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we have a pillar with community. So we have divided our member into small groups of five to 10 people um, and really encourage that strong community building 
uh, and uh, through the means of mastermind and true mastermind, not like the 200 people mastermind where you don't get hot seats, right? <laughs> um, you actually go on the hot seats uh, twice a month. Uh, you log in with other folks who are like-minded in your cohort groups um, and you share the, the things that you did, the challenges that you meet and they help you like unblock that. Uh, and it serves as accountability because how many of us has bought courses and have never opened it? I'm mm -hmm. guilty of doing that. Mm -hmm. I have thousands of dollars of courses sitting in my inbox and never even opened them. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't really benefit if you're not learning from a course you purchased. So it's serving as accountability and to make sure that they actually be doing their next step. Uh, so we don't want to just educate. We want them to actually go ahead and do the stuff that we teach them to do. Right. So setting up the solo 401k uh, and making sure you're setting up a whole life insurance policy where it makes sense to do infinite banking and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so then the third pillar is um, learning from osmosis. So we have a podcast kind of similar to yours over here uh, with what we call a My Story series, for lack of better titles for them, uh, where we interview heroes, we call them. Um, the people who has quit their nine to five job or who has never had a nine to five job, uh, but has a successful small business or large business for all mm -hmm. I care um, and have a system. But the difference is they're focused on system building system processes where they can step away from their business, not mm -hmm. the mom and pop type of business. So, or people who has reached their financial freedom early in their life, you know, living the style of life that they wanted to be uh, not exactly the lean fi type but it's like they pictured out this is what we want to do and they hit their number they become retired early um the main suite of that is to inspire people that these are real examples out there you can be in any profession open any type of business it can be successful but there is a underlining formula that is making them successful right um, so we want to kind of share that with people and people can kind of consume this whole library of videos. Um, and then should they feel like they want to go into that business? Cause a lot of us who went and fight early, just like me, we're not just sitting at home being retired. It's like you're pursuing something that you're passionate about. So, so these are great example and possibly network of people like, cause you know, you got to know how to contact them and et cetera in the series. Uh, and if someone was like wanted to get into a specific field of things, they can contact a person and be like, hey, uh, making that connection, essentially. Um, so these are kind of three pillars of EZFI University. Um, and all together, they can become a full circle to um, basically providing an action oriented environment and a roadmap for some to get there uh, in 10 years or less. I think a lot of our members going to get there in five years. Yeah. Very inspirational. Uh, yeah. So uh, one more time, just uh, how do folks get in touch oh, with you? Just to clarify yes. that. Yeah. Um, so, so you can check us out at www.easyfiuniversity.com. And I'm very active on Facebook. So find me, Elisa Zen, on Facebook. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and you can also email me at elisa at easyreestate.rocks, R-O-C-K-S. Um, but, you know, the best place to kind of find me is on Facebook and potentially LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Well, my last question for you today is when you come to the end of this life's journey, how do you want your epitaph to read? Oh, that's a difficult one. It's very hard to uh, come up with that. Never thought about that. Because I never thought I would have an epitaph. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I think it will read uh, like, you know, Elisa, I'm not very good at writing. So I would say like uh, she who has helped a million people in financial literacy. Well, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Elisa, uh, for being on the program today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I hope we can have future conversations yeah. uh, to learn even more about you and come back and check on you and see how uh, easy FI University uh, is doing. I'm sure it's going to do very, very well. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, Elisa.
Thank you, Alan. Thank you for tuning in to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors brought to you by Steed Talker Capital. Steed Talker Capital works with both new and established investors nationwide, creating opportunities to flourish in all areas of life. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steed Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steed Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures great and small flourish abundantly. For resources to enhance your well-being through multifamily real estate investment, connect with us online at capital.steedtalker.com.